Hello, I'm Kevin Fernando, a GP working near Edinburgh in Scotland and content advisor for Medscape Global and UK. Welcome to our podcast, Medical Mentor, a bite-sized regular chat for all of us working in primary care. Podcasts will cover hot topics, practice pearls and hacks, as well as pitfalls to avoid, helping make our lives a little bit easier in primary care, but ultimately to help improve the lives of our patients. So let's start with a patient whom we might all see in primary care. James is a 48-year-old gentleman who has been living with type 2 diabetes for around four years now. Past medical history includes recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis in his 20s, secondary to excessive alcohol intake. However, he's been abstinent of alcohol since. James came to see me in primary care due to ongoing concerns about erratic blood sugar levels and loose bowel motions. There's no family history of bowel cancer. James self-funds a continuous glucose monitor as he experienced a couple of significant hypoglycemic episodes previously. His weight is stable, BMI currently 22 and waist to height ratio 0.48. His current HbA1c is above target at 88 millimoles per mole, or 10.2%. His current medications are metformin, 1 gram twice a day, empagliflozin, 25 milligrams once a day, and citagliptin, 100 milligrams once a day. Understandably, he's worried about his risk of diabetes complications and frustrated about his persistently high HbA1c, despite taking his medications regularly, and maintaining a healthy weight. So what do we do next for James? Do we switch his metformin to a slow release preparation to see if that will ameliorate his loose bowel symptoms? Do we add in a fourth line oral hypoglycemic agent such as the sulfonylurea glycoside or add in an injectable therapy such as a GLP-1 receptor agonist or insulin to try and reduce his hyperglycemia? Do we send off a stool sample for a quantitative fecal immunochemical test to check for any occult blood in his stool? Or do we check C-peptide levels and autoantibodies to see if he is insulopenic and or developing an autoimmune form of diabetes, such as latent autoimmune diabetes in adults, which is essentially a slow-onset type 1 diabetes? Or do we do something entirely differently again? Well, James likely has type 3C diabetes. Now, I know what you're all thinking. What on earth is type 3C diabetes and why do we need to know about it in primary care? Well, type 3C diabetes is diabetes associated with any disease, trauma or surgery of the exocrine pancreas. And it is often misdiagnosed as type 2 diabetes which is why I'm telling you about it today. As a reminder, the pancreas has an endocrine or hormone secreting function, production of insulin from beta cells and glucagon from alpha cells. But the pancreas also has an exocrine function, digestive enzyme production such as amylase, lipase and proteases occur in the exocrine portion of the pancreas and both endocrine and exocrine functions of the pancreas can be affected in type 3C diabetes. Causes of type 3C diabetes or pancreatogenic diabetes include acute or chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis accounts for around 75% of cases of type 3C diabetes. Other causes include pancreatic cancer, pancreatic surgery, trauma, cystic fibrosis, and hemochromatosis. In my clinical practice, I've most seen type 3C diabetes in the context, sadly, of pancreatic cancer. Type 3C diabetes often occurs quite early from diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. The incidence of pancreatic cancer has been steadily increasing globally over the last 10 years, and as we all know, carries a dismal five-year survival rate. So why is it important to accurately identify type 3C diabetes? Well, people living with type 3C diabetes such as James are nearly twice as likely to have suboptimal glycemic management 
and are at an increased risk of hypoglycemia, which unfortunately can be quite protracted if it does occur. This is because of loss of glucagon production from the alpha cells in the pancreas. Glucagon is part of the counter-regulatory hormonal response to hypoglycemia. It signals the liver to release stored glucose to increase blood sugar levels. So this lack of glucagon blunts the response to hypoglycemia. Additionally, people living with type 3 C diabetes are much more likely to need insulin within five years of diagnosis of their diabetes, which is around the time James has been living with his diabetes. So a key take-home message for us all in primary care is to ask about a history of pancreatic disease when diagnosing any type of diabetes. Specific features that may point towards type 3 C diabetes or pancreatic exocrine insufficiency include diarrhea and steatorrhea or fatty, frothy, foul-smelling stool that floats, abdominal discomfort, flatulence and bloating, weight loss and fatigue, and erratic blood glucose management if severe exocrine dysfunction is present. So if we suspect type 3 C diabetes, what can we do in primary care? Well, a useful test is a stool sample checking for fecal elastase 1 levels. Low levels of fecal elastase 1 are suggestive of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. C-peptide levels are generally low and pancreatic antibodies are absent. With regards to management of type 3 C diabetes, this will be mainly driven by our secondary care, diabetes and endocrinology colleagues and our gastroenterology colleagues. But it does involve the appropriate management of malabsorption with pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Type 3 C diabetes does carry an increased risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis due to possible vitamin D malabsorption so vitamin D supplementation should also be considered. Type 3 C diabetes itself sadly carries an increased risk of pancreatic cancer, so we should remain clinically vigilant to this. With respect to glycemic management, incretin therapy should be avoided, so DPP-4 inhibitors or glyptins such as citagliptin, GLP-1 receptor agonists such as semaglutide, and dual GLP-1 GIP receptor agonists such as tazepatide should all be avoided. This is because of a putative association with pancreatitis and potential worsening of gastrointestinal symptoms with these therapies. We can use metformin, and actually metformin has a possible protective effect against pancreatic cancer. Sulfonylureas such as glyclozide are less effective due to declining beta cell function in type 3 C diabetes and their increased risk of hypoglycemia. SGLT2 inhibitors can also be considered, although there is an increased risk of diabetic ketoacidosis given the insulin deficiency we see in type 3 C diabetes. People living with type 3 C diabetes on SGLT2 inhibitors should be counseled appropriately with sick day guidance. Ultimately, insulin is required for most individuals with type 3 C diabetes to deal with this insulin deficiency and actually may be required from the outset if HbA1c is markedly elevated. So what did I do for James? I sent off a stool sample which demonstrated low levels of fecal elastase 1 which confirmed my suspicions of type 3 C diabetes or pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. I subsequently referred him to my secondary care diabetes colleagues with a view to initiating insulin as well as the ongoing management of his pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. I also stopped to citagliptin. Finally, I produced a Medscape UK primary care hack or clinical aid memoir on the diagnosis and classification of diabetes in primary care, which includes diagnostic pearls and pitfalls to avoid for healthcare professionals on a variety of different types of diabetes, including type 3C diabetes. I hope you find it helpful. 
So thank you all for listening. I hope you found this podcast helpful. Please do listen to our future Medical Mentor podcast, which will be available on all major platforms. Follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dr. Kevin Fernando, or email me on kfernando at webmd.net if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future podcasts. Thank you again for listening.